Hi friends, great to have you back. This is lesson two of our art project, Repeated Suites. Now remember, we're doing art projects. There are four lessons that you must watch in sequence. So if you haven't watched lesson one, do that first, and then come join me for this lesson two. Okay, so let's talk about what you need for today's lesson. We have a lot of supplies, so take a look. You're going to need a plain sheet of 11 by 14 Bristol board. It has to be thicker than regular paper in order to hold up with the water. A set of watercolor, at least eight. I have 16 here, but at least eight pan watercolors. A waxy coated paper plate that has a white center. A bowl of water, nice and clean. Some brushes, at least one that's medium large round and one that's a little smaller couple wads of paper towel to help clean our brushes. You'll need the shapes that you cut out from lesson one. And you'll need a good pencil with a nice sharp point and a white eraser. Okay, so we've been working on our project called Repeated Sweets because we're going to be doing a watercolor in the style of Wayne Tebow. Wayne Tebow, the American pop artist, he's still alive today, born in 1920, and has done so much, especially in this particular style of sweet treats that he repeated. There's a lot of paintings of everything wonderful to eat that you can imagine. Gumballs and lollipops and pies and cakes. In fact, I want to show you this particular painting by Wayne Tebow because it really signifies some key elements that we want to include in our project today. It's called Cakes and it's from 1963. And you'll notice it's repeated round cakes on round cake stands. So he chose a particular motif and repeated it over and over. And also, notice the strong shadows. Each shape is a motif. Now here's another one by our friend Andy Warhol. Now we looked at Andy Warhol's work back in lesson one, the Campbell soup can, the single Campbell soup can. Well, here's another Andy Warhol where that same motif is repeated. And this is Campbell soup cans. And you see there's multiple cans here, but they're all a little different. They're all different kinds of soup. So there was a lot of similarity, but then a subtle difference. Now that's a key component, my friends, in what we're going to be doing. We're going to have repetition, mostly the same, but with fun, subtle differences. Something that was used by Warhol and Tebow in their pop art. So, do you have your little pile of shapes? Did you finish cutting things out from lesson one? I have my pile right here, so let's get started. Now, we did some careful observation of our treats, and you've drawn some, maybe even some from your imagination. But now it's time to kind of look at them to decide what motif are you going to use. Do you remember motif? Motif is a single repeated object. You probably have a motif in your room, right? Maybe um, uh, a piece of sports equipment like baseball, in your wallpaper, on, even on your bed linens. Uh, maybe in the room around you where you are right now, maybe an upholstered chair or a curtain that you can see. A motif is really strong in art and design. And that's something that the pop artists were trying to tap into in the American culture. Now, I'm looking at my shapes or motifs that I'm going to be using, and I can see a lot of things I'd love to try. So how do I start? Well, we know we're going to be repeating. So... Space is the first thing you want to consider. Now you have your board in front of you and you have your shape. It shouldn't be any bigger than your hand, right? Your fist or your palm. And so, hmm, if I were to repeat this, I could fit three comfortably. You don't have to do three. You can decide on doing four. Let me just show you an example. Here is four pieces of cake with strong shadows. So if you would prefer to do four, that's fine. You repeat as many times as you like. Well, what if I chose the popsicle shape? It's smaller, it's finer, because it has the stick. I might prefer to do that diagonally. So you're going to have to play around with your piece of paper and your shapes to decide what shape you're going to use and what format you're going to do it three, four, 
straight across diagonally. But now it's time for us to choose and draw. And the first thing we're going to do, I'm going to choose the cupcake, is trace. And you might think, well, this is drawing. I want to learn how to draw. Why are we tracing? Well, one of the key things of Thibaut's art was that most of them, in terms of their actual shape, were exactly the same. It was the small details that were different. So in order to get our motif to be exactly the same, much like in wallpaper or upholstery, where there's a repeated thing that is exactly the same over and over, we're going to trace. So in order to trace well, you want to make sure you have a very sharp pencil. So sharpen your pencil. You're going to draw lightly so that you can erase your lines if you need to. And have your eraser handy. Now, I th I'm going to start with my first cupcake, but I'm going to start with the one in the middle. And the reason I'm going to do that, I've decided I'm going to do three across. I want to do the one in the middle so that then I can see how much space I have on either side. It's important for us to leave space between your various shapes so that you can create space for the shadows. Remember, in the first lesson of this project, we talk about how important the shadows were in Thibaut's work. He used that as a motif as well, to fill the negative space. So, don't start to the left or right, because then you might run out of room. Start kind of with your middle one. If you're doing four, start in a corner, if you're going to do the four corners. And I'm going to have it kind of right in the middle of the page. Now when you trace, you want to hold the object that you're tracing, which is called your template. You want to hold your template very still. And you're going to use a nice sharp point, and you're going to take your time by resting the pencil right along that cut edge. Now because this was Bristol board and not paper, it's sturdier. It's very hard to trace just around a piece of paper. But I'm taking my time. And my lines are probably a little darker than yours, so it'll show on camera better. But yours should be nice and light. And then I'm going to carefully remove my template. And there I have the outline. You notice it doesn't have the detail of my original, but it has my outline. So now that I have that one, now I can play around and say, hmm, I know I need to leave some space in between for the shadow. So I'll do the one to the left. I want to kind of make it even from the edge of the paper to the next cupcake. They don't have to be exactly on the same line. And now I'll trace again. So you should be tracing your chosen motif. Now friends, here's the great part. We're just doing pencil right now. Supposing you trace your motifs and you decide you don't like the way it looks. Select a different motif, flip the paper over, and do it again. So now that I've traced the one to the left, and I kind of like the spacing, I'm going to go to the one on the right, leaving room for the shadow. Hold my template nice and still. Make sure my pencil point is nice and sharp. and trace slowly, no need to rush, around my motif. There! So I'm going to keep my drawn cupcake right here so I can see the details for when I work on my final drawing. Now the first line I'm going to do is the line where the cake batter meets the cake cup. You decide on the line that makes sense based on your shape. So see how there's indentations here? I'm going to just carefully draw that line. Now they don't need to be exactly the same. Remember, Wayne Teambo's gumball machines, even though the machine was the same, all the gumballs that were in there were different, each one. Each of those pies in his pie paintings were a little different. So now that we've got the exact same outline shape, now these can be a little different. And I see that I have icing that's dripped down. I want to make all those drips a little different from my cupcake. So here's the frosting. So I'm just going to kind of do a wavy line like that. But this next wavy line is going to be a little different. The drips are going to be in a different spot. A little bit of variety, even though we're doing the same. OK, let's do the line for the cherry. It's really kind of a half a cherry, and it's pushed into the 
frosting so it won't be a straight line. It's kind of pushed down. There we go. Now, a maraschino cherry, the types of candied cherries that they use in baking, is actually very glossy and shiny. So there'd be a little highlight that we're going to have there. And we're going to talk about that uh, a little later. So I'm not quite done with the cherry. Now, there's this fluting. It's kind of pleats that are on the cupcake cup. Maybe you've seen that if you've ever helped out in doing some baking. I'm going to put that level of detail in, but I'm not going to do it all the way across, and I'll explain why in a minute. On this left-hand side of each cupcake, I'm going to do vertical lines, and I'll probably do about, oh, I'm going to say maybe five or six, and then I'm going to stop. Same here. Now keep your lines light, my friends. Some can show through the watercolor, but you don't want it to be really dark coming through. Were you with me for Art Lesson 1? We talked about value then and the importance of shade and shadow. Value is the amount of light or dark in something. Okay, and value can go from light to dark based on where your light source is. So you have to make a decision as the artist, where is the light coming from? We know that shadows are a really key element of Wayne Thiebaud's pop art, and we want to put in some strong shadows. But before I can draw those shadows, I have to make a decision. Well, I've decided I want the light to come from the right-hand side, which means my shadows will be the opposite on the left. So if the light is coming from my right, that means the highlight on the cherry will be on the right and the lighter side of this rounded cupcake bottom will be on the right. So, let's put in the highlight on the cherry. It's just kind of a curved rectangle like this at the top and that just means where the light bounces off the shiny cherry. And so that means the light's coming from this direction, lower right, which means my shadows will go off to the left. Let me give you an example by showing you some of Wayne Thiebaud's art. Here is gumball machines again. Remember this? This is where the light is coming from the left and so the shadows are going to the right. Now take a look at a painting we looked at before, Big Suckers. That's where the lollipops are laying flat and so the light is coming from the right and the strong shadow, including the stick of the lollipop, is going to the left. So, once you decide where your light is coming from, let's put in your shadows. Now, how do you draw a shadow? Well, a shadow lays flat on a surface, okay? So, we're going to assume that these cupcakes are laying on a surface. So, I think what I want to do is let's put them on a table first, and that'll give us an idea of where the shadows are going to rest. So, let's put a line, and it doesn't have to be super straight, above the cupcakes going all the way across. So we have kind of our table and then what's behind the table. So if these are on a table, then we know that the shadows are going to lay flat. The shadow has to be attached to the object that's casting the shadow, right? That makes sense. Have you ever walked on a sidewalk on a really sunny day and the shadow is in front of you and it's attached to your feet, right? It has to be attached to the item that's casting the shadow. So, my light's coming from my right, so the shadow, I'm going to have the shadow go off to the left. It's an object that has a straight side, so I'll draw a straight side off at an angle, but a cupcake has a, like a rounded top, so I'm going to do a rounded top. Now, I can't see the rest of the shadow, it's behind the object. So what about this one in the middle? We want it to look exactly the same, very much like our main motif. The shape is exactly the same. I want my shadow to be the same. So the same angle, straight line, and the rounded top of the cupcake is behind it. So then I'm repeating it over here in our repeated suites. Straight line as an angle coming from it, that's the shadow cast by the side here, and then the rounded top. So now I have three cupcakes, the main motif, three shadows that fill in that negative space, and that's a really strong element of Wayne Thiebaud's work. Really strong shadows, repetition, 
Very similar, but a little bit different to make it visually interesting. Okay. So, you should have some level of detail into your motif, but what if you have a lot more detail? For example, what if you have something like sprinkles on the icing of a donut? Well, that's okay. Draw them in lightly now, whatever level of detail you have so that you're ready to go with the painting. Okay? Awesome. Now, the first thing we're going to do for our painting, and this is an important step that we have to do separate from the others, is we're going to lay down what's called a flat wash. Now, when you're working with watercolors, friends, it's different than working with other types of paints. And it can sometimes be frustrating. So if you pay attention to a few basics, you'll have a great time. All we're going to work on today is a flat wash. That means a solid layer of color that doesn't have any detail that's around our cupcakes. Okay? So if you look at the one I have up here, this purple, this light purple is our flat wash. Don't, not the shadows, not the cupcakes, but this area here. Flat meaning all one tone. So how do we get started? Well, we're going to pour a little puddle of water into our paper plate. Now, the puddle should be about the size of a cookie. Not too big, not too much. There we go. So once I have my puddle of water, we now need to make that puddle of water filled with pigment. And so you have to make some choices. Now, I know I'm going to want to uh, paint my cupcakes with probably orange um, cupcake holders and then I know the cherries are going to be red, and I'm probably going to have a lot of different color on my frosting, but I probably won't choose purple for my frosting. So I'm going to use purple as my flat wash of my background. So make a decision on color, and that's going to be your wash. Now you might decide to do the wash over the entire paper. That's fine too. That's going to be for the next time we're together a graded wash. Today it's a flat wash. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to dip my brush into my um, bowl, and so it's nice and wet. And I'm going to lay my brush on the pan on its side. Now this is called loading the brush. And loading the brush means trying to draw that pigment, the color, onto the brush. And the best way to do that is to simply roll the brush on its side over and over. Now friends, I see some friends who smash the brush head on into the paint, and that's not good for the brush, and it's not good for your paints. So I'm going to continue to roll and roll and roll. Then I go to my puddle, and I'm going to swish it around in my puddle, so I'm taking the pigment out of the brush. Now that's way too pale, my friends. So this process is going to go on for a little bit until I get a nice puddle that's darker than that, okay? It's all the same color. You shouldn't be mixing any colors. You've made your color selection. And so I'm loading the brush by rolling it on its side in the pan. This seems like an awful lot of preparation, doesn't it? We haven't even started painting yet. Well, preparation is really important. I want to make sure I have everything ready, my paper towel so I can keep my brush clean, clean water nearby, my shapes, samples if I need to look at them for guidance on color. Preparation is key, friends, for any project. You know, that reminds me of a Bible verse in the New Testament. Jesus had a cousin named John the Baptist. Do you remember that story? And John was sent specifically to prepare the people for when Jesus was going to be coming. So let me read you this passage, Matthew 3, 1 to 3. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And this is who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. See, John was sent specifically by God to prepare the people because they just weren't ready yet to understand that their Messiah, that they'd been praying about 
all their lives to come, they weren't ready for him because they expected something different than what Jesus was going to be. So John was saying, you better get ready. Repent of your sins. Think about what your life has been like because the Messiah we've been waiting for is finally coming. That preparation was important. I bet you you prepare for things like like when a guest is coming over. Maybe you straighten your room or help get a special dinner. What about when you prepare for a birthday party? You probably do a lot then. Oh, how about if you have a competition or a recital coming up? You probably practice a lot, don't you? You're preparing, and it's important to prepare well. So that's what we're doing here. We're preparing for our final stages of painting. Okay, so I've loaded my brush a few times. I have a nice puddle of a medium purple. And so to do a flat wash, what we're going to do is actually work very quickly. And that's because when you linger with water on board, it gets soggy and sometimes it can even tear the paper. So you're going to work quickly so that the watercolor washes over the surface and we want nice even color. So I'm going to use a medium to large soft brush. I'm going to start right at the top where that line is and I'm going to drag my brush quickly and I'm going to keep going back in. Now I am going right over my shadows, not over my cupcake, just over my shadows. Because we're going to make those shadows much darker with the same color later. Now it's trickier when you're going around the object, I know that. But if you work quickly and pull the paint along with you, it becomes a nice flat color. So now I'm down here below the cupcakes and I can drag the brush quickly. And you don't have to worry about being real exact around the lines because watercolor has a great quality about it where you're expected to do some overlap where the translucent color shows through. Now you see how pale this looks on the paper. That's because the white of the paper is mixing with the pigment in the water. And the, one of the theories of uh, watercolor is the wetter the brush, the lighter the color. The drier the brush, the richer the color. So I don't want it to look real stripy. I want it to look flat, nice and even, that the color is all the same color. If a hair comes out from your brush, you're going to have to kind of go back and pick it up. So the color looks fairly even, fairly flat. And I can go back in with my big brush. That's a flat wash. Now we can't really go any further, my friends, for today. And the reason is when you have wet paint and you try to paint next to wet paint, especially watercolor, it bleeds. And we don't want that. So you need to let your flat wash dry for a long time, make sure it's perfectly dry before we move on. So we're actually going to end lesson two right here and we'll do more painting when we come back and this is dry for lesson three. So I'm so excited to be working on our repeated sweets. I know they're going to be so yummy and as unique as you are. Oh, friends, Always, when you're finished painting, the best thing you can do for your supplies to keep them well is to clean them well, and that takes a lot of time, just like we talked about preparing. So prepare for the next lesson by cleaning out your brush really well and cleaning off your paint tray. Okay, we'll see you next time.